Welcome to Ask the Expert. Um, Ask the Expert is a brief, informative, and lively discussion with experts in type 1 diabetes and related interdisciplinary research. We're recording this event. We're going to post it on the Sugar Science site YouTube channel shortly after the presentation. If you have any questions for our guests, raise your hand um, in, or put something in the chat. And at the end, we can also ask questions or answer questions. So today we have Drs. Gail Box and Jan Masrer. I'm sorry about that last name. Mer you say it. Mrazek. Thank you. That sounds much better. Um, <laughs> and so we are going to be talking about their company, Alcara Inc. It was founded in 2016 to help safely and effectively uh, deliver therapeutics using protein nanocapsules called vaults. And vaults are hollow protein cages that naturally exist in the cytoplasm of human cells and most other eukaryotes. So Alcara actually specializes in the packaging and manufacturing of vault nanocapsules using this proprietary NCAT, which is trademarked, and N antibody trademark technologies invented by Okara's founders. Um, and so why do we, why are we interested in, in these vaults? Because they do have uh, a footprint in the autoimmunity world. And so we're gonna talk through that with um, both uh, Dr. Spox and Dr. Jan. <laughs> yeah. Morozik. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so let's um, let's give a little bit of a bio about you both. Why don't you um, go first, uh, Gail, and tell us a little bit about your yourself, how you got um, you know to where you are now? Yeah. So my background is actually in microbiology <laughs> and immunology, and uh, I went on to pursue a PhD at UCLA. And during one of my rotations, I was working on a vaccine against chlamydia. And we were using the vault nanocapsule as the delivery vehicle for this vaccine. And um, that's how I came to collaborate with Jan in his lab. And it turned out he was doing all the electron microscopy for me. <laughs> I did not know that at the time. And uh, so we um, started this great uh, relationship um, all around vaults. And I was, although I didn't join that lab, I, I went on to do more um, innate immunity and type one interferon and in viral infections. Um, I kept a close contact with Jan and I was uh, kind of watching on the sidelines and, and interacting about all his uh, adventures and misadventures in working with the vault nanocapsule, which eventually led to a very um, unique discovery that led us to form a company. And so um, while my training has all been primarily microbiology and immunology, I became very fascinated with these vault nanocapsules, um, primarily through Jan's work and, and the exciting stuff that he was finding. Yeah, these, these vaults are really interesting, you know, particles, I guess you would call them, right? They're, yeah. They were only recently found, I mean, you know, sort of some, uh, you know, I guess if you could say recently is 86, right? Yeah. So, um, but, but they seem to be a little bit elusive. We can dive into that, um, you know, in some tissues, we can just dive into that later, but let's talk a little bit about uh, your background, Jan. Well, I'm a chemical engineer by training, but then I went to Austria to do my PhD on non-coding RNA. And uh, during that time, I developed a technique with which I discovered that world associated RNAs are overexpressed in Epstein-Barr virus infected cells. Yeah. And so, you know, natural uh, curiosity was what is world associated RNA? And it turns out it was part of the world complex. And nobody, none of the professors really knew that, that world complex existed. It's three times the size of a ribosome, yet nobody knows about it. So I was very fortunate because I applied for one postdoc position at UCLA, a place where vaults were discovered. And I was uh, luckily admitted and uh, um, I stayed with vaults since. I mean, I, I'm fascinated with the vault structure I think they are very beautiful. They are. Yeah, they are really beautiful. I mean, it looks like, you know, they almost sort of look like a little, almost a proteasome sort of feel to it, but it, it also has a, a shape almost like a, like a grenade or something. It's really yes. amazing. Yes. Yeah. And, and so why is it that some, it was so, um, you know, they were missed for so long? I mean, because they're not always there, right? Well, you know, it's a protein-based nanoparticle. It's not a lipid vesicle. And I think they discovered them uh, sort of by accident when they were trying to isolate 
um, what is it like uh, coated vesicles. Coated vesicles. And mm -hmm. uh, they use the technique called uh, negative staining when you use a very diluted concentration of uranyl acetate in the electron microscopy. And uh, the uranyl acetate settles into the grooves you know, of, of the uh, protein, and then you can see it. So originally people thought it was just a viral contamination. Mm. But uh, eventually uh, a postdoc in uh, Dr. Leonard Rohn's lab, uh, I think she discovered that those uh, walls were encoded on the uh, human genome, uh, sorry, red genome by then. Yeah. The red genome was uh, first. Yeah. yeah, and they, uh, so so the Rome lab is still very active in at yes. UCLA in pursuing sort of like the identity of these, um, you know, particles. Yes. Yeah. And so, Let's go back to like your, you know, the, the paper where you saw um, that the expression of these vaults were related to Epstein-Barr um, disease. So I, I want to just make a very important distinction. There is vault-associated RNA and there is mRNA coding for the major vault protein, yeah. which is the main component. So. In Austria, we only saw the upregulation of the vault associated RNAs. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did not really see the upregulation of the MVP, the protein. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what is RNP, ribonucleoprotein complex? So, the, the, the RNA component is the vault associated RNA. In the, in the case of humans, there are what RNA 1, 2, and 3. I mean, they little bit change the nomenclature, it changes. I think there is a fourth word RNA. In the case of red, there is just one word associated RNA. Okay. And so when I try to do some you know, experiments using the fish technique, then um, I couldn't see a lot of the word associated RNA associated with the word. Most of it was free in cytoplasm. Mm -hmm. So this might be two separate things and misleading. So in Austria, just the word associated mm -hmm. RNA. Hmm. And, That's interesting. And uh, do you have any hypotheses about, you know, around that uh, observation? Well, well, it's interesting. The group that I left, uh, I did a PhD in Austria, they uh, uh, pursued this further. And in 2015, they published, I think it was Nature Communications or Review uh, Communications, um, that the world associated RNA1 in particular, was involved in uh, apoptosis regulation. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Nature Communications, I saw that paper, expression of the vault RNA protects cells from undergoing apoptosis. Yeah. Um, that was May 2015, yeah. yeah so, so that's kind of curious, though. If you've got these vault RNAs and, you know, they're kind of, um, you know, protecting the cells from undergoing apoptosis, they're also seen in cells, uh, I think, particularly breast cancer cells, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, that experience multi-drug resistance, right? They sort of upregulate. So like they're trying to, their, their function is to kind of keep the cells alive and, 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 and protect them from apoptosis in that context. Um, and so if you're thinking about the beta cell, I mean, we just want to extrapolate here, the pancreatic beta cell, there's evidence that it undergoes some stress and eventually apoptosis. And then maybe that's one of the reasons why the immune system's alerted and the auto um, antigens are, you know, informing the immune system. So I wonder if, um, you know, if, if has anyone seen these wall cells in the context of pancreatic uh, islets? I don't think so. Yeah, so yeah. when you look at the expression of the vaults in the pancreas, we actually have a slide about this. Um, you, you don't really find it within the beta cells. Um, you don't see a lot of um, transcript or protein for it. It's primarily, if you do wanna classify it uh, being present, it's in the exocrine um, part of the the pancreas. So, okay. um, but even there, it's a, a pretty low level expression compared to other tissues in the cell. Uh, it's in the body. So, um, 
that could possibly be the reason why, you know, the pancreas is susceptible to this kind of, um, you know, attack, uh, stress, maybe vaults, you know, something we've hypothesized that vaults might be, you know, protective, but it, it could also just be the vault associated RNA that's um, providing that, um, you know, protection against apoptosis. So it's really not clear at this point, but you can definitely speculate there's a role for vaults in providing that kind of immunity. And, and recently there was a paper showing uh, MVP associating with lipid rafts yeah. and um, talking about its role in um, protecting against uh, extrinsic apoptotic pathway activation. And so that's something that I think warrants a, another look. But one of the caveats in working with um, vaults in general is how to detect them. And so when you're using monoclonal antibodies, um, you're typically targeting against a single MVP strand. Mm -hmm. And we know that vaults uh, naturally are present only as a nanocapsule unless they're being assembled. And so looking for that distinct nanocapsule, you'd really have to do something um, a different kind of technique that doesn't destroy the capsule to really find out what its function is. What's the half-life of the capsule once it's assembled? Yeah, so that's a good question. It seems to be fairly stable. And I don't think that there's really been um, detailed studies into the half-life. People have looked at biodistribution of the vaults, but within the cytoplasm itself, it might actually be quite stable over a long period of time. Depending and on the cell type, you mean? Yeah, so you're looking at the metabolic activity of the cells, whether they're more quiescent or not, and that might and influence all, turnover. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It also depends on their stage of differentiation. Yeah. So, for example, in alveolar, alveolar cells, you know, in yeah. lungs, you have in the alveolar cells type 1, and there are no walls, while in alveolar uh, cells type 2, it's a like very, very high expression of walls. Yeah. It's, it's the same same cell, it just uh, didn't undergo the differentiation. differentiation into type one. Yeah, because type two are progenitor cells for the type one. I see. So in the, the lung space. So we, we observed uh, high expression of walls, mainly in epithelial cells. You know, you see a lot of uh, walls in liver, lungs, you know, even in gut. gut. In, in gastrointestinal um, and also the acinar cells though you said the acinar cells of the pancreas right yeah yeah the exocrine yeah yeah exocrine pancreas that's interesting yeah. so um yeah and do you guys um you know when you're sort of like looking uh, at senescent cells what's the what's the profile of vaults in senescent cells has anyone looked at that you know, I don't think that's been studied well either, um, but it, it seems to be more associated with, as Jan was saying, the differentiation state and, and type. And it's not clear whether vaults are disappearing over time, but potentially in more terminally differentiated cells, you may not find as many vaults. And, mm -hmm. and that might, might be related to its function. It's, it's not clear. If they become senescent, though, they kind of, you know, go backwards. So that might be yeah. something to look at. Well, that is... Also Oh, sorry, go ahead. Also, interestingly, you know, the transcript of uh, world mRNA is not necessarily correlating to the protein levels. Mm. So you have cells where you see very little of uh, world mRNA, yet you see very high levels of protein. How can that work? Yeah. Well, the, one explanation would be that, for example, in this case, the half-life of the particle is extremely high and you need just a little bit of transcript that constantly roll the production of the world and the world accumulates over time if the cell has a long lifespan. And the other thing might be, oh, yeah. the other thing might be the walls are being taken up, <laughs> which uh, I think nobody showed that. People are trying to find a receptor specific. I don't know if you mean like endocytose from the ex yes, exterior yes. into the cell? Yeah, we know that walls are well endocytosed by, for example, dendritic cells and macrophages. And yeah, essentially antigen presenting yeah, cells can by take APs. up yeah, vaults. And you know, that's kind of the foundation for our company in terms of delivery, uh, if yeah. we want to go with the more natural route to the vault. So if we just go for passive uptake, we're looking at endocytosis. And for that purpose, we're looking for vaccine you know, development. Right. Um, so some immune yeah, reactions. Mm -hmm. 
So. It's really interesting. And then can you just briefly, you know, kind of go through the route of once the vault is inside the cytoplasm, say we were just sort of thinking about the scenario where like, okay, a vault has been endocytosed by like a macrophage or something, it's in the cytoplasm. The route, uh, I mean, it has, a, it has a trajectory there where it can move into the nucleus, right? So that's uh, something you know we're interested in. What I was doing at UCLA with the um, chlamydia vaccine is looking at trafficking at the vaults uh, following uptake by uh, monocytes and other you know APCs. And so looking at the trafficking, I was finding that the vaults were entering into the, um, the endosome, but they were escaping. So they were actually going through an endolysosomal fusion, but yet they were escaping into the cytoplasm. And so we know that they are definitely out into the cytoplasm. And there's been publications to show that the geometry of the uh, nuclear pore, as well as the uh, cap of the vault has a nice fit to it. And there's been some uh, data to show that they actually dock to the nuclear pore. Now- Not that they dock, but that they associate. Associate, yeah, They yeah. couldn't show that because it's, it's uh, below the resolution. That's true, yeah. That's uh, that, a better term. That's what we want to do and show one day. <laughs> I mean, it's really, uh, to me, uh, you know, with the cell biology background, it's really a, a beautiful, um, you know, kind of um, yeah, a place to study. It seems mm -hmm. so interesting. But let's talk a little bit about what your company, I mean, I think you have a couple slides. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So actually, we wanted to, to start um, just showing a little bit what the vault is, because uh, I think that's not necessarily... Um, known yeah so let's just known by some but it's not widely known yeah so we'll, we'll just skip over here to this um let's see here this slide here it would be great to show your first slide though just so people know have a, yeah. have a visual of the um i don't know why we're starting on the wrong yeah there there we go that's a beautiful yeah. logo so thank you <laughs> yeah so um Essentially, our, our company, as you had mentioned before, was uh, developed uh, to um, bring the vault nanocapsule as a safe and effective delivery vehicle. Um, and so we say it's using nature's design because we're not uh, destroying the nanocapsule structure itself. And so um, we'll skip over the team slide, but uh, it's essentially the two of us right now, and uh, we're just working to uh, develop out distinct platform products um, for this. And so this is, um, as Jan was talking about earlier in 2007. Yeah, we, uh, we wanted to give you the chronology, how we got to work. That's <laughs> why we placed this slide here. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, it's nice. So it is a technique with the um, EBV infected uh, and, B cells. And if you focus right here, for example, that's the upregulation of what RNA 1, 2, and 3 in the EBV infected cells. And you see yeah. the numbers are staggering. Yeah. You know, it's not like two, four, three, four. This is like a huge, four. huge increase. Yeah. And, you know, recently they've just, um, papers have just come out uh, linking EBV directly to um, MS, multiple sclerosis. Yes. That's an interesting space to sort of start thinking about the, you know, your paper, this paper, and, and what's happening with vaults. Yeah. yeah. And so the, 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 there are other things. We also think if you look on the world assembly, we also think that, for example, Alzheimer's disease or, or the diseases that, that deal with the tangles, protein tangles, could be caused with dysfunctionality of polyribosome templating, which we will speak later about. Yeah, fascinating. So, and then here's a beautiful micrograph of our negatively stained vaults uh, beyond captured. So, so many. Uh, it's this very beautiful, you know, symmetric structure that has this, you know, twofold symmetry to it. So we have this cap here and here. We have the waist of the vault, and uh, it's just very uniform and monodispersed. And that's something else that's very important for a drug delivery. It, it is very rare to do electron microscopy and the CF field. You know, wherever you look on the electron microscopy grid, you will see the same picture. You know, electron microscopies, they have this bias. They always focus on one spot on the electron microscopy grid that looks the greatest. They take image. <laughs> Here, wherever you move the object, you will see always the same picture. They are very homogeneous. They are literally wow. like clone to each other. Later, we will again explain that the polyribosome templating 
ensures that each world is identical to the other. Yeah. So every world is exactly made from 78 copies, never one or uh, more or less. And this was something that was uh, fundamental to actually the formation of our company because prior to Jan's discovery about how vaults assembled, every researcher, vault researcher thought they self-assembled like a virus. Yeah. And so this would lead to some heterogeneity in their structure and, and it didn't really match with the data. And so what Jan discovered is that the polyribosome shown here, so here's the ribosome, two components, large and small, assembling on an mRNA strand and working from five prime to three prime to synthesize a, a protein, in this case, a major vault protein. And as the ribosome progresses from the five prime to the three prime end, the peptide of course grows. So, so here in red is our growing MVP polypeptide. And you can see here the formation of uh, dimers as it moves along. And then those dimers coming across start to stack one on top of the other. And this forms the shell of the vault. And so this is a very well-coordinated spatial um, in space and time to be able to form these sheets. And then you have the, the secondary structures helping to form these curves to close off into the cap of the vault, where you see the alpha helices here forming the cap and closing off to form the vault nanocapsule. That is a beautiful rendering. Yes, and so this was really a phenomenal when Jan discovered this and you know, he kept working it over and he was like, self-assembly is wrong. It's wrong. Mm -hmm. This is an actually very coordinated, structured process and it, it requires a polyribosome to form. Even philosophically or energetically, why would you produce 78 copies of major world protein that would diffuse in cytoplasm? Yeah. Then they would miraculously come back to self-assembly. Yeah. You know, that's... Um, yeah, it didn't make yeah. any sense. And so really understanding how they formed is what led us to form the company so that we could bring this particle and use it properly. Um, because a lot of times uh, the way it was being packaged and, and developed before this, um, it was illogical, it was inconsistent and the data never um, was reproducible. So this actually led to three main points as a conclusion that you can, can take from this model. So one is that one mRNA makes the whole world. You cannot have two mRNAs making one world. Mm. Because it's one mRNA that might, makes the polyribosome. And if one polyribosome makes the world, you cannot mix different mRNAs. Yeah. So therefore, uh, previous studies that if you show two different mRNAs made mixed world is incorrect. Yeah. And there were always issues with it. This would explain why there were issues because the side-by-side -side interactions of individual MVPs, they have tendencies to make tangles and misfolding if they are denatured and or renatured. So this really um, is so reminiscent of, <clears throat> of like a knitting machine or something. Really <laughs> yeah. fascinating. Yeah. So in the reality, this, this model is not planar. It's more in, the, let's say you have three ribosomes per turn rather than two. So this, this, this rendering was simplified for visualization and also, yeah, so. Is this, uh, is this similar to how the proteasome is produced? You know, we were speculating that polyribosome templating, this technique might be applicable to other monomeric, multimeric proteins. Yeah. No, sorry, I said it wrong. Many multimeric yeah. homoproteins. Yeah, right. And so, you know, why would cell waste that energy? I think everything is done in the place where it produces, which is the polyribosome. Yeah, but this is definitely the first case where it was more than, you know, two monomers coming together. We had some NF-kappa B and, and some other uh, proteins that were found to be templated by the polyribosome, but this is a very extreme example where you have 78 copies of a single protein coming together. Yeah, very um, different than the ribosome. Yeah, yeah. the next, yeah, mm -hmm. ribosome is a very diverse molecule. You have RNA, you have mm -hmm. multiple proteins. So yeah. it's, a compo it's, it's a composite, this is, this is not. So the other point that one can take is that you always get 78 copies of the major world protein, hence the very uh, high homogeneity among the world sample. Then uh, 
the next thing you can take the message away is that there is a direction. It's kind of like uh, once you make the wall and you break it, there is no way back. It's like a vector of entropy. Uh, you, uh, you cannot just produce proteins and then purify them and hope they will reassemble. You need the coordination of the polyribosome. Okay. So that's also for us very important because we think if you want to package something into the wall, it, it should be happening during the assembly. Okay. Um, and, and so you've got 35,800 um, uh, nanomolar uh, cubed continuous cargo space inside. Yes. What so kind of things can you package? A huge opportunity. So the largest is you can literally fit uh, <laughs> the ribosome in. It will be very tight fit. And it, it's, it's not realistic. You can stuff it in there. But just to visualize just the to whole visualize. ribosome in there. Right. It's big enough. And how how are you thinking about you know filling these? Uh, you know from I guess this this sort of top dock area is open. Uh, yeah, so bottom areas open. No, we we the, have a, a the, few techniques for. You, you, I want yeah. to mention, you said there is an open area. You, you mean here on the caps? Yeah, the caps. So that's a misconception. It's not. It's very tight and closed. Okay. It, it is only open because this is taken from high resolution uh, crystallography data from Hideaki Tanaka. He published it, I think it was 2009 in a science paper that uh, in order to have 3.5 angstrom, he had to cut them out from the model. <laughs> Okay. But, but there are C termini are coming together and they are pointing inwards and they are very, very jammed. There is no space, they are very tight. But because they are disordered, they had to be taken out from this model. So, the so crystallography, there's a few areas of the vault that don't have a lot of structure to them, or it's very difficult to determine the structure due to the flexibility. And that was the primary area. So, when you look at them, the model it always looks like it's open but it's not okay yeah if so, it was it, it would make our life easier to pack, package <laughs> but uh during my stay at ucla and uh, even further in our company we tried but we realized it's tight it just doesn't go in not even small dna yeah. oligo nothing so we make sure to point out there's a minimum cargo leakage uh, with these vaults once they are packaged and so we do have some uh, different technologies that we use to package them. And we yeah. can package molecules, um, primarily protein in nature, but uh, we can also um, package other uh, molecules, nucleic acids, RNA, DNA, that type. Um, yeah. And so depending on the molecule and depending on what the objective is in delivering, how the function is supposed to be, we have different techniques for this. And this is primarily our NCAP technologies and our NAB technologies. So depending on the, the area where we were focusing to, and we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Yeah, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that also uh, technology allows us to target the vault to different areas. Um, so we said naturally vaults are taken up by antigen presenting cells. Well, if we don't want that to happen, we have ways to modify the vault so that it is targeted to specific receptors. Nice. And, um, and although, you know, nobody really knows the function, what we have found is that they're very non-immunogenic in terms of generating an antibody response. It's essentially impossible to generate an antibody response to a full intact vault. All antibodies are targeted to a single MVP that people have isolated and yeah, denatured and then um, targeted for an antibody response. And so that's something that is uh, really an interesting. And um, um, in terms of- It also has to be taken into account if you read publications that are showing uh, immunostaining, <laughs> showing native walls, it's probably not the native walls what they are showing, it's, a, it's an artifact. Yeah, so mm -hmm. either the vault is already destroyed or yeah, there's some non-specific binding. So, um, but something that's important actually today because of, uh, you know, COVID and all these booster vaccine, you know, yeah. the vaccine that out. Uh, so far we found that we can do unlimited booster dosing without the negative side effects. And so, you know, when we look at our space, we are looking at liposomes as 
our primary um, you know, competitor or carrier because liposomes are often used for vaccination as well as delivery of other drugs that are considered toxic, you know, right. like uh, doxorubicin. So you have doxel for you know, chemotherapy. And one of the issues with using lipids is that you have a toxicity associated with the lipid particle itself. And so these are non-natural lipids. And some people have um, non-specific reactions. It can be as, as tiny as a little fever or some um, discomfort, but it can be as big as a cardiovascular event. And so, you know, just different people will react differently. And about a third of patients will have some reaction to the lipid. And so when you think about that administered over time, you're probably going to have more severe effects each booster dose. And so that's something to take into account when you're trying to develop a program, a regimen to, for treatment. When you're talking about this delivery, though, um, how do you imagine or do you have evidence that already shows um, the delivery? Yeah, so we have um, some data which we can show you. Um, let me... Yeah. Let me, if you, we can get to it as we go. Yeah, we'll, we'll show you in a little bit. So um, just looking at um, expression of major vault protein, protein, this is all coming from uh, immunohisto um, chemistries or um, IF, IHFs um, from the human protein atlas. Um, distribution of the major vault protein you see primarily, as Jan mentioned, in the epithelial cells, primarily associated with the lungs and GI tract. But we wanted to point out the pancreas here, so it's considered a low level expression overall. Um, but, but again, within the pancreas, you have to focus on the cell type specifically. Yeah. You know, it's uh, pancreas is a, <laughs> an, a diverse environment, yeah. and there are you know resident uh, macrophages that have some low level of expression as well. And um, so here again, uh, looking at uh, the different organ systems, you can see that expression in the pancreas of the mRNA here on the left is um, not too bad. You know, it's not a, a mid-level expression, um, but the protein itself is expressed in a very low level. Um, Which doesn't make sense. You would so, expect those words must be exported. So, and now and the so, question yeah. is, how do you export something so large like a world? Yeah. So yeah. That, that's how it's because... being, being detected. Yeah. yeah. So this is an interesting uh, phenomenon. And this could just be limited by the techniques and again, by the antibodies that are present um, to be able to recognize the major vault protein. And it could be that the technique they used didn't destroy the vault enough so the antibody could bind to its epitope. And so there's a lot of caveats, as I said, using antibodies to detect vaults. And so, uh, it could just be that they couldn't detect it because uh, the antibody wasn't good. But has has here, no one done the um, uh, electron microscopy on these tissues? I don't think so. Yeah, I think, you know, when you look at the cell itself, it's a very crowded environment and it's difficult to find the vaults. Yeah. And so even looking at very thin layers, and I think that's why, you know, it's kind of, um, the, 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 an accident that it was found in the first place. This is a very laborious technique. And uh, in order to see if you want to use electron microscopy, and either you want to use the cryo electron microscopy or the classical old uh, microscopy when you use like uranium acetate or other types of staining transmission microscopy. And uh, you still have to slice the cells because the specimen is so thick, you would see nothing. So you need to slice it to 50 nanometer, sometimes 30 nanometer. So, you know, it's very difficult to see the world. <laughs> not, not many people will make this effort because it's a technique that just only few people know in the world how to make it. And uh, yeah, you have to get a cell that has a lot of those walls expressed. And even if you get it, it's very difficult to interpret it because uh, if world is 60 nanometer, you might even slice the walls. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, depending on the orientation, you may not be in the correct, um, yeah. You know, if the walls are random, you don't see this nice shape like when you see on our pictures when all of them, they are laying, you know, that you see both ends. Yeah. And so that can be a little confusing um, to see what you're looking at. You can't um, do like a um, sedimentation or anything like that to try to separate them out. Yes, you can. You can you can disrupt the cells and extract the walls. That's how they were found in first place. I think uh, that's how they isolated 
Yeah, yeah and, and they chose a tissue that had a lot of cells. So the liver was chosen because that's mm -hmm. a tissue that, I mean, it's huge when you think about it. But when they were trying to isolate the vaults for crystallography, I mean, they were going through tons of livers just to get enough sample the Japanese to be group, able yeah. to uh, get the images that they needed to from the uh, crystallography. So I think that's uh, an important thing to note as well. I mean, if you think about sedimenting out um, from one cell type, how many of those cells do you actually need? And if you look at uh, cell lines, then you always wonder, well, is this reflective of the natural um, state of the cell? Because transformed cells are different than you know, um, primary cells. And so you always have those differences. Yeah. So I, I think that's another you know, caveat. So there's, there's many issues in working with vaults in their native form and their native uh, habitat, I would say. So it, it was published, they were able, I think a group in Pasadena, they were able to see walls using cryo-electron microscopy on uh, living cells, or not living cells, but what, what, they, what they did, they actually focused on the very end of the cell. You know, the, there is the nucleus that's very thick, you cannot see through, but if you go towards the edges, the cells are getting flatter and flatter. So that's how they saw walls. Yeah. So, um, yeah, then looking at uh, the type 1 diabetes, as you were mentioning earlier, you know, this uh, stress of the beta cells. And so knowing that beta cells, to our knowledge, don't express vaults, it, it could well be that this is um, something that leads them to be more susceptible to different stresses. And that's something that could be uh, related. And this loss of, you know, the Treg and uh, the fact that there are there are already some uh, T cells that are going to have um, immunity against beta cells and that aren't culled during the initial negative selection. And so those all are factors that may be involved in, in the you know, development of type 1 diabetes. And so you know, I think this was a very interesting um, you know, review that came out recently uh, in 2021 um, that that really describes the, the differences in how to, to think about uh, type one diabetes. It's not just a T cell dysfunction, you know, potentially it could be the fact that the beta cell itself is dysfunctional. And so yeah. these stresses, as you were mentioning earlier, you know, with um, EBV and MS, and then you have the CVB and uh, potentially the beta cells, and these all can be factors. And, you know, um, when we were, thinking about, you know, what is the role for the vault? When we talk about the vault in our company, we're always talking about just the shell of the MVP. But naturally, uh, vault is existing with two other proteins, um, uh, VPARP or PARP4, and uh, TEP1, which is a telomerase- uh, Associated protein. Protein, yeah. And so, um, and then uh, potentially, you know, four non-coding RNAs. And so we definitely know that the non-coding RNAs are more susceptible um, to viral infections and their expression levels will increase and decrease um, based on Jan's early work with EBV and B cells. And so it could be that different components of the vault are actually responding and maybe not the vault itself, or that they're all responding and that could be you know, playing a role in this apoptotic um, or anti-apoptotic environment. And so that's something that um, like we were talking about earlier in 2015, uh, Jan's former uh, colleagues back in Innsbruck uh, showed that vault RNA protects against a uh, cell going under, undergoing apoptosis. And so- I wonder if you were to populate or somehow get uh, beta cells in, in uh, vitro to uptake some of these faults, would it be protective in a, you know, sort of a cytokine rich, you know, immune cell yeah. rich environment? Yeah, or even, you know, transform them to express beta cells. I mean, to ex the beta cells to express vaults, you yeah. know? And it would be nice to see, for example, to uh, transform them with, uh, you know, different components of the walls also, you know, mixtures of it, either entire intact walls, wild type, or just lacking, you know, wall RNAs. So, yeah. yeah. That sounds like a great experiment. <laughs> <laughs> Who's game? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, you know, we mentioned earlier that the major vault protein itself was uh, found associated with lipid rafts, and this seemed to play a role um, 
with the bacterial um, components of the homosterine lactones that are signaling molecules um, primarily used uh, by gram-negative bacteria. And so the, this group here, they, they did find that there was some potential role for major vault protein itself, but they were never able to see a vault uh, directly. Uh, they did do some work with recombinant vaults to show that it was binding um, to this uh, homosterine lactone. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, work that needs to be done still, but definitely these things definitely uh, show that there's some interactions going on and whether they're very specific or whether it's nonspecific, I think it needs to be further studied and which component actually is responsible for this anti-apoptotic or this, you know, protection from extrinsic apoptotic pathways. It, it remains to be seen. Oh, so, th th this is a very significant yeah, paper. But very interesting, um, definitely. Yeah. And so what, what we're doing with our company is we're just using the vault shell itself. So forgetting about the other two proteins, forgetting about the non-coding uh, RNAs, and we're taking this shell and we're doing different um, packagings. And so as I was talking earlier, our NCAP technology where we're putting different cargo molecules inside of the vault itself. And so that's using some proprietary technologies that we've developed in our company and uh, using that uh, for presentation to antigen presenting cells for specifically a T cell um, function. So this is where we want the antigen oops, to um, enter into the cell and be processed for uh, um, display on the HLA or MHC, depending on the uh, cell type uh, uh, model system and uh, getting a very specific T cell response. And we have some data to show later on this. And then our other one is the NNAB technology where we're targeting to specific cell receptors to be able to get either uptake or um, to be able to uh, affect some change of that receptor itself. So those are our two primary um, platforms that we're using with our, our vaults. Mm -hmm. And so looking at um, delivery of a protein vaccine, uh, we have a grant right now for this, um, looking at developing a therapeutic cancer vaccine um, where we deliver uh, self antigens that are overexpressed in cancer cells. So these uh, tumor associated antigens we can package with the vault and deliver in vivo. They're naturally taken up by antigen presenting cells. And then we induce a specific T cell response to help the body to uh, see those specific um, cancer cells that are overexpressing this antigen and to destroy them. And so that's uh, one um, thing, but here's some data from a different experiment, but similar lines where we looked at uh, um, uh, expansion of CD8 specific OVA T cells and uh, activation marker CD69 with uh, vaults that were delivering the OVA antigen. And this is just to, to show some in vitro data and uh, the in vivo data we're uh, collecting right now and comparing against uh, bacteria, listeria as a positive control that's overexpressing OVA itself. And so we know that this is a very common um, research tool to be able to induce an immune response. And when we look at the OVA vaults that we are uh, delivering to the mice, or in this case to a T cell population, uh, we see that there's a huge um, expression of CD8 activation and by the T cells. Uh, and you can maybe mention better that this Listeria OVA, you know, this is a system that Actually, listeria is overexpressing on its surface, over albumin. It's live listeria. It's a live listeria. And so, so this, this produces one of the most vigorous immune response you can imagine. But the problem is you can eventually get uh, listeriosis. <laughs> what is it called? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe uh, uh, too much. Yeah, <laughs> too much the, 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 there was a great hope for this, but I think the issue is with this live listeria, which can uh, turn uh, badly. Well, you also have many different uh, antigens yeah. associated. So when you also look at uh, activation of cytokines, you need to temper it down um, to some extent. You can't have a huge storm that might actually overwhelm the, the host itself. Yeah, so that's why you are very pleased we use the walls. It's, it's just a particle. This is not a giant bacteria, you know, that has LPS and is producing this uh, recombinant uh, over on the surface. 
So it, it worked very well. We were very yeah. excited about it. This was one of the reasons why I think we also. Yeah, yeah it's like a specific targeting. Yeah. yeah, so, and this is more just to induce a specific response. And then our specific targeting is more with our NAB, which is also using a proprietary technology uh, where we are able to deliver um, whatever molecule we're interested in on the outside of the cell. And so here again, is just showing a protein um, that we're delivering to specific uh, receptors. And so this is something that uh, we've developed out and uh, shown that we had a specific uh, expression on the vault with some immunogold labeling uh, with an antibody against the epitope that we were um, uh, delivering. So here would be the, the vault expressing the, the epitope and the antibody specific to the epitope labeled with a gold um, and shown by electron uh, microscopy. Mm -hmm. And so this uh, similar showing targeting to specific um, that specific receptor on a cancer cell line. And so showing that uh, our vault can be targeted to that particular cell. Um, so, so this vault particularly has that uh, specific uh, ligand that is binding to the receptor on the surface of the cell. And uh, we labeled those walls with uh, fluorescent dye, you know, green dye. You can see that uh, uh, in the, when you put it on cells, you see walls between the cells, but they don't really accumulate to the membrane, but yeah. you, you see how they accumulate. Yeah, you see that very punctate uh, foci. Uh, and this is just um, uh, immunofluorescence. Um, yeah. So you can see there's different uh, through focusing for the the layers, the punctate uh, vaults that are accumulating. So, yeah, that's, re that's really nice. Yeah. So when we're talking about our, you know, competitors, we're just looking at pretty much anyone who's using liposomes. And so, most familiar to people today is going to be Moderna and uh, Pfizer BioNTech because they're producing the COVID vaccine uh, with the liposomes that have been uh, modified to be able to bind to the RNA that they're delivering. And so these liposomes are cationic and uh, cationic lipids have been associated with adverse effects in uh, patients. And so when you are looking to modify lipids to be able to get that binding, you have to think about all the different uh, side effects that might occur uh, with this modification. And so um, immunogenicity is one, which we've kind of already talked about from very mild reactions to even more severe, um, you know, cardiovascular effects. Um, you also look at stability. One of the big issues um, with liposomes is that they have to be stored. Um, there's a cold chain associated with it, whereas our vaults can sit on the bench top. They're stable. We've had them on the bench for years, and they have really no loss of cargo or um, of um, integrity. Integrity, of yeah. So. Um, that's something that we find is also very useful, uh, especially delivering to places that don't have the capabilities to have a, you know, ultra low minus 80, minus 70 storage, even minus 20 can be sometimes difficult to uh, swing, especially in areas where you don't have that kind uh, of um, infrastructure. Our, our walls are stable up to 50 degrees Celsius, which is unbelievable yeah. for a, such a complex protein. So, but yet because they're made of protein there, your body can break it down. It's not like a silica particle that's gonna sit in your capillaries and, and cause um, you know, problems with your joints. This is something that can be cleared by the body. Um, so that's another thing that we really like is those endogenous pathways for um, degrading these uh, particles. And so, um, yeah, we have really no immune response and uh, we have a very uh, unless clean- Unless we put antigen. <laughs> unless we put an antigen. Yeah. <laughs> but it, to I'm say, wait, what itself. about the cargo? Pardon? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> say, what about the cargo? But yeah, I yeah. know it just naturally it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's uh, non-immunogenic. Yeah, so, um, so in, in that case, you know, when you look at the vault, you think, wow, this is really, really great uh, capsule. And I think that a lot of researchers can find a use um, for the vault in gene therapies, as well as um, vaccine development, whether it's therapeutic or prophylactic, there, there's a lot of opportunity. And uh, we've developed out some specific products and uh, working to develop these uh, with other partners. 
and we're always looking for new partnerships or, or people interested. And something we hope to offer later is some vault reagents that are off the shelf, ready to use for researchers. And so- Are you open to collaborations? If anyone in the scientific audience hears this and is kind of curious, like, oh, I'd love to maybe definitely. try this in my system. Yeah, yeah. definitely. We're, we're we'll very be, open to We'll it. be happy to send them votes. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, that's fantastic to know. I will definitely promote that as well. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of there's so many um, there's a lot of room for inquiry here. Yeah. And um, so, oh, what's this? Beautiful. Yeah. So www.okerasolutions.com. Yeah. So this actually was uh, done uh, by David Goodsell on scripts. Um, he's an amazing um, artist uh, and researcher. <laughs> um, I think he's a biophysicist. Yeah. So he does structural biology and yeah. he also has this talent from the god to <laughs> do such a thing yeah. beautiful yeah yeah so we're we're definitely open to any collaborations academic or commercial and um yeah we just we are fascinated by the vault and we hope to spread this <laughs> i think everybody must be fascinated with this beautiful structure <laughs> yeah i think it just definitely deserves more attention and we're going to try to um put it out there so that uh, at least this type 1 diabetes focused audience will kind of get their interest peaked and and hopefully reach out and and maybe something really interesting will come of it so yeah. it was really great having you both on today i, I appreciate yeah. your time and um i really am excited to see what you do next it's really yeah. fascinating Thank you, Monica, for the opportunity to share our work and ideas, and we really enjoyed uh, speaking with you. Great. I enjoyed speaking with you. I hope you guys have a great rest of the day. Thank we'll talk you to too. you later. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.